the Achilles tendon ruptures, non-operative, open, percutaneous, and chronic. So Achilles tendons is the largest and uh, strongest tendon in the body. It's very commonly injured, typically a combination of intrinsic, extrinsic factors. So you have your rapid acceleration, deceleration injuries. These are typically non-contact injuries. You have also changes typically in the Achilles. So they usually have some kind of symptoms prior to injuring it. It's a bimodal age distribution, typically more active patients. They're 25 to 40. You also have an older age group, you know, around 60, 65. Increase in males anywhere from 3 to 20 to 1 compared to females. Imaging is not usually done routinely. Um, certainly if they come through the emergency room, they make it to your office, they'll usually come with some type of imaging. Um, they can be helpful if you're suspicious. So if you're worried about if there's tenting on the skin, you're worried about some type of vulgian injury, x-ray can certainly help. Um, if you have a patient that describes you, they've had symptoms chronically in their, in their ankle, like, oh yeah, every now and then they got a sharp pain and it kind of went away. So you may be concerned about some uh, tendinopathy there, some calcification, so I think x-ray is helpful in that situation for planning. Um, MRI is really for, if you're worried about a partial rupture, it can give you some information. Again, if you have a patient with extensive chronic symptoms with distal tendinopathy, it can be helpful. Ultrasound uh, is also utilized, but it's very operator dependent. So in general, uh, you know, the big debate now is uh, operative versus non-operative and the controversy and the non-operative treatment, which has become a much more popular advantages, of course, there's no surgery, no uh, wound issues. Disadvantage is that even though there's studies that have not shown a statistically significant difference in re-rupture rates, the trend is certainly toward a higher re-rupture rate than operative treatments. It also requires a very strict adherence and compliance to a non-operative functional protocol, which is uh, uh, very difficult for many people to adhere to. Many of these studies had patients that were either in the military or some kind of rehab program where they were forced to be very compliant. Um, just because you're not doing surgery doesn't mean you can't have complications. So we know this from other ways we treat fractures and also you can still have skin, skin complications from some of the bracing. Um, the advantage of operative treatment, there were multiple studies that have shown you can have improved strength, especially plantar flexion strength. You can have a quicker return to work. Um, again, a trend toward lower re-rupture rates or some of the newer studies don't show a significant difference in increased functional outcomes. So non-operative treatment with oral functioning bracing. So you can put them in a cambu right away. I tend to still keep them protected weight bearing. I use uh, foam wedges, um, about three centimeters, so three times one centimeter wedges. First, I just let them take it easy just for hematoma consolidation. At three weeks, I let them really start putting more and more weight on it, and I remove one wedge each week. So usually <laughs> by about six weeks, they're down to flat. Um, I do start with early mobilization. It's very important to have them go to the physical therapy two to three times a week in this, in this three-week period uh, to try and get them back active dorsiflexion to neutral. And then I, I start uh, walking them in the cam boot, maybe just even just a little heel cup just for comfort, and they progress from there. So usually back in regular shoes around 10 to 12 weeks. But again, compliance is absolutely essential. So it's not just going to physical therapy. They have to understand what the functional program is, and, and, and the patients really have to be compliant. I think this is the biggest problem with non-operative treatment is that a lot of these studies, the patients, again, are a captive audience. A lot of our patients are not going to be as compliant, so they may not see as good results. Um, in general, non-operative treatment is, is more indicated in patients that have lower demands, less physical, have other comorbidities. There have been a few studies that have shown also the last three things, poor nutrition, COPD, patients with bleeding disorders. These patients do worse um, with operative treatment, so we should really hedge toward non-operative treatment in these patients of all ages. Again, there have been a few studies comparing operative versus non-operative treatment. The biggest one was by Willits, and they showed no significant difference in re-rupture rates, ankle range of motion function. However, these patients were all diagnosed very early, so many of us aren't going to see these ruptures until much later than this, sometimes two and a half, three weeks by the time they come in. So you need an early diagnosis to be able to start them in appropriate non-operative treatment. Again, you need strict protocol compliance, and even in this study, it still showed the operative group had stronger plantar flexion. Another meta-analysis showed no significant difference in re-rupture rates, so there was a trend toward better um, with the lower rates in the operative group. But the operative group returned to work 19 days earlier, which can be a significant difference in the active or active working population. In this uh, other study, Renninger, this was the military. So again, this was a young, active, compliant cohort, so a very contained group of people, not going to be typical of most of the patients that walk in our door. Uh, and they returned to duty one and a half months earlier. So it's pretty significant if you're an athlete or you have an active work, um, that's a big difference. And then last year, this meta-analysis came out that said that the re-rupture rates were lower in the operative treatment in all studies, even when functional rehab was used. So still a lot of controversy. 
So when you're deciding uh, to do operative treatment, of course, the decision's complex. It requires a thorough discussion of the risks and benefits of the procedure. Certainly in younger, healthier patients, um, my, my trend is still to uh, fix these patients. I think you can get a, have a stronger tenon, quick return to work, military, military duty in play. These patients in general tend to have a stronger tendon to begin with. And so there have been studies that have shown that the, the, the stronger the tendon in medial lateral circumference, the stronger the repair. So the better these patients do. So my typical repair, if I'm doing a, an open repair, I, I do a medial approach. Um, I curve it distally, medially, and um, then I come up centrally as I go more proximally. You want to avoid proximally the sural nerve. Um, dissect sharply down. I try to do this in one flap and elevate the peritoneum. I want to minimize the undermining of the skin. Um, I retract, but I don't leave retractors inside the skin, inside the wound. I expose the tendon fully, I debride it, and then I usually repair it in slight plantar flexion. So I don't routinely drape out the contralateral limb, but you can do that to make sure you get it correct. Typically, I use a locking crack out stitch with a heavy non-absorbable suture. I like to get four strands across the repair side in most patients. And I do an epitendinous 2-0 uh, absorbable suture, which I think it helps, and studies have been shown to help reinforce the repair. It can improve the tendon apposition. It can debulk the site. So you can improve the strength of the repair uh, by doing that. Occasionally, I may release the deep posterior compartment. I think it makes the closure a lot easier. It gives an area for the hematoma to consolidate so it's not more posterior where your wound is. You're also able to attack that FHL muscle belly immediately, so it gives you some more mechanical support for repair. It also helps with the, the vascularity of your repair. It's very important to get a watertight closure of your peritoneum. Uh, if you don't do this, you will have wound healing problems. Um, it also is a very highly vascularized structure, which allows for also for a smooth gliding surface of your tendon, so your motion will be better afterwards. So I typically splint them for three weeks. So I splint them for a week, I can come back just so I can look at the wound. I put them in a cast then for another two weeks and have them come back, so really just for wound healing. And then I start getting in a boot with the lifts and progress from there. So I'll start range of motion at three weeks and then I'll start weight bearing at six weeks and then progress from there. Usually return to sport is around nine to 12 months following Achilles. So there's been a trend now to go toward more of a percutaneous or mini open. Uh, there's studies have shown that there's a similar rates of patient satisfaction re-rupture rate, lower incidence of wound complications. Studies have shown it can be as strong, biomechanically even stronger than a Krakow. Um, the increased load to failure and the failure may be at the suture tendon interface as opposed to the suture side itself. Patients tend to recover quickly, more quickly too, because you don't have to deal with the wounds. You can get them moving quicker. I think this is still contraindicated though if it's a very proximal or very distal ruptures. Um, also, if you don't see these early. So usually I, these are patients I would like to operate ideally within the first three to five days if possible. A lot of times you don't even see these patients for the first three weeks or so and it becomes a much, difficult, much more difficult procedure to do at that time. So you can do it either transverse or longitudinal incision. If you're gonna do a transverse incision, you wanna make it around one centimeter proximal to the palpable rupture. I prefer to do a longitudinal just so that I can uh, make it extend solid if needed. Um, and you're able to then have your incision and you can assess uh, the tendon apposition and the quality of repair. I use this jig and uh, I put an Alice clamp on the proximal stump one so that I freed up the adhesions uh, and I advance it. And this is within the peritoneum, so deep to the peritoneum within the pseudo sheath. And then you pass the sutures. We're gonna have one of these in the lab so you guys can all see it and play with it. So usually two non-locked, one locked suture. Uh, it's at least four centimeters away from the tendon. And so uh, in all these ruptures that Proximal four centimeters in the proximal stump, the four centimeters in distal stump, that's the worst, the worst, the most compromised tissue. So you want to try and stay away from that uh, to maintain your repair. Um, once I've done this proximally and distally, I secure it in maximum plantar flexion, and then you lock it. So I typically do the unlock sutures and then the lock suture, and you go from nearest to farthest on either side from the repair site. Now, if distally, if it's a very distal injury, um, or and or if you have tendinopathic changes in your distal stump, then I think you can augment your repair with a bone suture anchor. I think uh, the concern here is, is number one, you're not gonna be able to get a good purchase, you're not gonna get enough um, stitches through the distal stump, so we can bypass it into the bone. Uh, the other uh, issue is that um, if you're concerned that your tendon's gonna elongate over time as well because you don't have great purchase, then this can help you uh, more confidently restore the muscle tendon length um, of your repair. So this can be done in similar fashion. You make a small incision at the side of the rupture. Um, you pass the sutures proximally where you typically have good tissue. So the three sutures are up top. And then distally, um, what you can do is you can make two little poke holes. 
on either side of the Achilles tendon at the level of the uh, prominence here on the tuberosity just below that. And then you can take one of these curved suture lassos and you bring it up through the distal stump and then you come out anterior to the distal stump into the wound. And then you can pass your sutures down and you can fix it with an anchor. So you fix it to the bone again, you restore the, the length of your muscle tendon unit. So this is the strongest tendon in the body. You wanna be able to store the length. You don't want this to heal stretched out. Um, and you can improve the strength because you're repairing down to bone. So I think especially in distal ruptures and tendinopathy, this is a good option. In terms of the, repair, the rehab, I, I do rehab these a little bit quicker. So I do still keep them in a splint for two weeks just for wound healing, even though the incision's small. But then at the two week mark, I'll start the progressive weight bearing instead of at six weeks. Usually six weeks, they're out of the boot. They can return to sport a little bit earlier, around six months. Now in the elite athlete, now how do these patients do? So across the board, the studies have been pretty similar, whether it's an open repair or one of these mini open percutaneous repairs, it's usually around 70, 75%. So it's still, even today, only about 70, 75% of these players are going back. Um, Anderson actually s showed that the more skilled players are number one, less likely to get injured, and also they're more likely to be able to return to their baseline. The patients, uh, the athletes that are used less prior to the injury are more likely to be affected and then they're less likely to be able to get back and play. So these are some numbers, you know, 75% 70, chance they can return to sport. Now if it's more of a chronic injury and chronic, there are various definitions, but typically anywhere over four weeks. This obviously has a poor healing potential. This typically requires surgery and there are a variety of techniques that we'll go over briefly. So you wanna, in general, debride the non-viable tendon segments excise the uh, fiber adipose scar tissue, release the adhesions of the proximal tendon stump to the sheath and the posterior fascia. And when we're doing this, you know, size really doesn't matter in terms of the gap. So um, you have to make this assessment at the t once you're open, at the time once you've debrided all the non-viable segments. So anything less than two to three centimeters that's within three months, I think this is still a good chance you can get an end to end repair. Um, you do your posterior fasciotomy. If it's anywhere between two and six, um, you might have to use something like a VY advancement, possibly a turndown. Any larger defects in general, fascial turndown is, is typically more of an augmentation to, uh, to try and get the ends together, but you're usually looking at some type of allograft, autograft reconstruction, possible augmentation, tendon transfer. So for the medium-sized defects, you know, three to six centimeters, the VY lengthening is a good option. So starting at the top here, um, you're debris the necrotic tissue. You're, trying to, you're doing the apex as high as you can. You measure your gap, and typically the limbs of the V are any from, anywhere from one and a half to two times the length of the gap. So if the gap is anywhere four or five centimeters or above, it's typically two times. If it's smaller, you can go one and a half. But ideally, to be honest, you want these limbs as long as possible. You don't want to detach the muscle from the, from the underlying peritinon. Um, and once you do that, then you clamp it and you bring it down so that you can close down your repair um, gently and then you can repair distally, and then you uh, close the Y up uh, proximally. If there's a small defect that remains, once you've approximated as best you can the edges, then the fascial turndown is a good option. So here you can identify the central edge. Um, typically, you look at the gap that's there. You go three to four centimeters proximal, and you can measure it out the central third um, <coughs> of the gastroc fascia. I put some stay sutures at the base. Um, so when you fold it over and you rotate 180 degrees, you don't want it to tear it through all the way. <clears throat> so then you secure it distally and cover it like that. Other options, sometimes you can augment it. You know, there were some, some of these freeze-dried human acellular dermal collagen scaffolds, augmentation. I don't tend to do this uh, anymore. Um, also, autograft options, allograft options for tendon transfers. FHL is the one that I use most commonly can provide you mechanical support directly to your repair site. It can also provide more of a vascular bed to what is otherwise a disvascular area where it ruptures. It's good because it's an in-phase transfer, minimal morbidity with the harvest. Um, the only patients that I probably wouldn't do it in are athletes and performance artists because you don't want them to lose uh, anything for their high activity level. Um, you can do this with a gastroc recession at the same time sometimes, it can help you. Um, I harvest it typically just through a single posterior medial incision, but you can also add a small medial arch incision if you want, where you can then tenedise the distal stump um, to the FDL. But I tend to find that I can just do it through my posterior uh, approach. So I incise the deep posterior fascia. I isolate the, the muscle belly. I put a right angle clamp so I make sure that I have the FHL. It's, it's mobile. Um, you want to avoid the uh, nerve vascular bundle is just medial as it goes down to the tunnel behind the medial malleolus. 
and then I'll have the ankle and the uh, great toe and uh, maximum plantar flexion, and I'll, um, I'll transect it as far distally as possible. And I'll take it back and I'll anchor it with a tinnitus screw. Um, I usually dorsiflate, and this is just right anterior to your Achilles stump. So I'll drill the tunnel when it's uh, dorsiflexed, and then I'll plantar flex it to get the appropriate tension when I pull it through. And what are other ways that we might be able to enhance our Paris? There's some literature that says we should be giving these patients doxycycline, can inhibit the elevated MMPs after tendon injuries. There have been studies that have shown three week and six weeks marks can show improve, improvement, and after that, the benefit kind of minimizes. Also, we discussed last night anticoagulation. These patients, Achilles, patients with Achilles tendon ruptures are definitely at a higher risk uh, for thrombosis um, than most of the other foot and ankle patients, and as high as 25%. And so, number one is when you're doing some of these more minimally invasive approaches, it allows you to be uh, doing your rehab quicker and more aggressively, so that can help. But in general, as Dr. Steinloff mentioned last night, you should really be doing risk stratified treatment for all these patients. So you want to try and give something, but also especially in these patients that are higher risk factor, they're listed right there. So conclusion, it's a very common injury. Um, there's a lot of literature now that shows that uh, functional non-op treatment can have similar outcomes. And there's definitely the trend is to doing non-op treatment in most of our patients. Um, I think most of the literature still supports operative management for athletes of all levels. Um, again, this is the strongest tendon in the body. You want to be able to restore the length of that muscular tendinous unit. You don't want it to heal lengthened. It gives you a stronger tendon, gives you improved endurance, it allows you a quicker return to play and to work. Surgical repair, mini open wound does not have increased complications. You have improved wound healing, early functional mobilization, improved post-op function, return to sport and work, patient satisfaction. So if you get these patients early enough, I think that's a great option. Chronic ruptures are challenging, but they will benefit from surgical repair. And there are a bunch of options. Again, size matters. So once you measure out the gap, that can guide you into how you can fix those.